So I guess uh, I'm going to start. So hello uh, and welcome uh, everyone to this webinar um, for the third edition of the MOOC Emerging and Re-Emerging Viruses. Um, my name is Maxime Chazal. I'm a research engineer at Institut Pasteur. I work in the antiviral uh, signaling unit. And I'm also your community manager for, for this MOOC. Uh, and I've been answering your, your questions on the forum when I could or passing them to the speaker of this course. So before introducing the, the speakers of today, uh, I'm going to explain you uh, briefly how this session will go. So we'll start by, by answering uh, some uh, selective questions from the forum or the registration form uh, for this webinar. And then this is a live session. So we will encourage you to ask your questions on the Q&A chat box uh, that you can find on the toolbar of Zoom. And so please don't be shy and ask uh, uh, any question you might have uh, about this course. Uh, so now I'm going to um, introduce you to, to the speakers of today. So the two directors of this MOOC, uh, Jean-Pierre Vartagnan and Pierre-Emmanuel Secaldi, and uh, our two guest speakers, Arnaud Fontanet and Frédéric Tangy. So I will let you introduce uh, yourself briefly and say a few words. And in the meantime, you can already leave the question of the chat. So maybe we start by Jean-Pierre, Pierre-Emmanuel, uh, Arnaud and Frédéric. Thank you very much. So good morning to everybody. So my name is Jean-Pierre Vartagnan. I'm research director at the Institut Pasteur, and I'm also the head of the Department of Virology. And briefly, I'm working on cellular restriction factors that are generally induced by type 1 interferon, and they are present to block uh, replication of some viruses. And I have been working with HIV, Hep B, and now uh, SARS-CoV-2. Hi, everybody. I am uh, Pierre-Emmanuel Secaldi, professor at the Université Paris-Cité. And uh, with Jean-Pierre Vartagnan, I am co-director of this MOOC and of the basic virology course of the Pasteur Institute. And I work at the Institute Pasteur on the interaction of different viruses with host barriers, such as blood-brain barrier, intestinal barrier. And we are we honored you for your active participation to this MOOC, your numerous questions. Thank you. Yes, it's my turn. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Frédéric Tangy, and, and uh, I used to be the head of the Viral Genomics and Vaccination Unit at Institut Pasteur, and now I'm the scientific director of uh, the new company uh, who is hosted here at Institut Pasteur. And uh, uh, the, the most of part of, uh, the, of my last uh, 15 years, 10 to 15 years at Institut Pasteur, was dedicated to vaccinology and, uh, and uh, to uh, the development of a, of a platform based on the measles vaccine used as a recombinant vaccine against other pathogens or against cancer. Okay, and good afternoon. My name is Arnaud Fontanet. I'm a medical epidemiologist working on infectious disease and particularly emerging viruses. Um, during the COVID-19 crisis, I have uh, served in um, scientific council advising the French government, and I have also been involved in a number of studies on um, places, uh, settings, behaviors associated with SARS-CoV-2 transmission, and also some cohort studies on uh, natural history and uh, immune response to SARS-CoV-2. Okay, thank you all. Um, so let's get started. So we'll start by uh, some selected questions. And the first one is going to be for uh, Pierre-Emmanuel. So what are the mechanisms responsible for the appearance of mutations in viral genomes? I don't know if you see my screen. Yeah. Uh, yes, about this question, uh, I will say that there are uh, three main uh, mechanisms that can be uh, uh, pointed out the, for the ge viral genomes variability. The first one concerns point mutations. They may be spontaneous or under physical and chemical agents, but a special case for RNA viruses, for most RNA viruses, because there is an absence of proofreading of the RNA polymerase, and that will in introduce mutations in the genome of uh, RNA uh, viruses. The second point, the second mechanism concerns recombination <clears throat> and uh, it occurs in case of co-infection of a cell 
and the polymerase with disassociate from the original template uh, acid nucleic and uh, will associate with another template, another strand of nucleic acid and that will produce recombinants. That's mostly for RNA viruses. There is also the possibility of break rejoin mechanism for DNA viruses with the DNA of different viruses that will break on the crossover. There is a third mechanism that is a special kind of recombination and we prefer to call it reassortments. That's only for viruses with segmented genomes. I mean, automax viruses, RNA viruses, Bunia viruses. It occurs in case of co-infection of a cell by two viruses, and it will, it will produce a reassortment between the different segments of the genome from the different viruses. And you will get a reassortment in the viral progeny of the different genome of the two uh, initial uh, virus. I would just say in addition that there are some factors that may promote the variability of viral genomes. In particular, you have to consider the high number of individuals infected, the high viral yielding that occurs, for example, in the HIV with a lot of people, a uh, million people infected worldwide and with a high productions for each cell infected. I thank you. Okay, thank you, Pierre Emmanuel. Um, so the next question is going to be for uh, Jean Pierre, I think. So it's a question about the lecture of Esteban Domingo, <coughs> which tells that Lisa mutagenesis is now an established antiviral strategy that involves increasing the mutation rate, usually through nucleotide analogs, so that the virus crosses the error threshold. So the question is how, how is it done in practice? Where and how this disruptive nucleotide? Uh, are introduced, and is this a method that can really work in uh, emergency of an emerging viral epidemic to, to be fought, or only a laboratory hope? And has, does, has it been tried uh, on SARS-CoV-2? So, thank, thank you, Maxime, for, for, for this question. So uh, effectively, it's, it's, a, it's a concept developed in the course of, of Esteban Domingo, but at the beginning, the concept was developed by Manfred Eigen, and the, the, the theory of, of my, 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 uh, Manfred Eigen was the catastrophe theory. And subsequently, uh, this theory was adopted in the quasi-species theory, which is um, uh, referred for RNA viruses. What is quasi-species theory? Quasi-species for RNA viruses means that uh, the virus uh, are closely related genomes where they differ by one or two mutations, and it's... Uh, uh, group of virus are traveling together. So they are, they are replicating at one point, which is called a threshold error. And as you know, in the course, you, you listen that more or less the mutation rate of RNA viruses is 10 to minus four or 10 to minus five uh, mutation per replication cycles, meaning that there is one mutation to the 10 to the four or 10 to the five mutations. And the idea is if you accumulate too much mutation, the, the virus will go beyond these error thresholds, and then he will accumulate too many mutations, then he cannot come back. So the idea is, would it be possible to cultivate the virus with a drug in order to accumulate mutation in the virus, and then you create too many mutations that the virus cannot go back in the group of, of, uh, of viruses that can replicate. So the first experiment, first drug used was done with the ribavirin. Uh, ribavirin was put in the culture for polioviruses or foot and mousse disease virus. And this why Esteban Domingo described that because Esteban Domingo started to make this experiment with foot and mousse disease virus. Then there is some other drugs which are purine analogs like uh, favipiravir that was used for Ebola. But um, I would say that uh, uh, I don't know if we can use that as a therapy. On the paper, it's, it's very nice because you accumulate mutations and then you have defective viruses. But then uh, uh, to go for, uh, for patients or in animal, I think that it's very, very complicated because you have so many variants and then you cannot, uh, I think, uh, blocks everything. 
I don't know if I answered to the question. If it's not clear, just uh, write okay. on the chat. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so the uh, next question is going to be for, for Frédéric. Uh, it's a question about Luis and Rones, uh, lecture. Uh, why replicant, uh, replicants haven't been used uh, for COVID-19 vaccine? Will they be in the future? And is there any reason to think that this replicant vaccine will be less uh, affected by a change in antigenicity of the spike protein upon mutation? Well, the, the replicants have not, not been used because the, the mRNA vaccine were faster. And the companies developing these vaccines were faster and, and, uh, and uh, with, with big, big forms uh, that we have never uh, seen in any vaccine development before. So this allowed a very rapid development. Uh, and the replicant uh, technology uh, uh, have not been developed in big companies, only in small companies so far. Uh, so this is probably the reason why. And even the self-amplifying or replicating mRNA uh, technology uh, was not used. It's really the simplest mRNA technology that was used. Uh, meaning an, an mRNA molecule uh, inserted into a, a lipo, a lipid particle. Uh, so yes, these technology, which are much more uh, uh, complex to develop, have not been used, uh, mainly uh, for uh, industrial reasons and because the big industry uh, has been the first, uh, both for modern, Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech to to develop their vaccines. And uh, everyone, everyone has seen that uh, the big companies, uh, Merck, uh, GSK, Sanofi, uh, failed uh, or were too late uh, because the, there was a case of, the, uh, of an emergency and, and you had to be very rapid to be the first. Uh, and the, the technology of uh, replicant, alpha virus replicants, uh, is not enough advanced for that, was not enough advanced for that. For the for the second part of the question, of course not. Uh, this would have would have not changed anything uh, because this is the other uh, mark uh, of these vaccines is that the single antigen used is a spike protein. So this is again, except for the for the, the tetanus toxoid or uh, anatoxin vaccines, it is the first time that the vaccine against a virus is based on a single antigen. Of course, this is very uh, dangerous because, well, we experience already that, that the virus is mutating and, uh, and uh, the antigen, the circulating antigen is uh, changing while the vaccine is remaining the same. Uh, uh, this would have been exactly the same with uh, an alpha virus or any other uh, replicant uh, or any other uh, amplifying RNA or system uh, based on a single antigen. This is just because the, the antigen is only, uh, I remind that the, the spike is only a 13% of the genome of the, of the SARS-CoV-2. So you are missing 77% of antigens in these vaccines in order to be fully protected. Okay, thank you, Frédéric, for your answer. Um, so the next question is probably going to be for Arno. So it's a question about Simon Kuchemes course. Uh, the question is, in the various models presented uh, in the course, the mortality rate of an epidemic is never mentioned. Is this a criterion that can modify the mathematical models for predicting the evolution of an epidemic? So I'm sorry, because I'm not um, aware of what Simon has presented in, um, in his uh, MOOC. Um, the model can have different outcomes um, and uh, you could choose whether you are interested in um, risk of dying, um, but it can be also when it comes to uh, COVID-19 risk of saturation of the hospital, whether it's intensive care unit or a regular hospitalization. Um, so you I mean, this is basically the choice of what is your outcome and um, predicted number of either deaths, ICU beds occupied or conventional hospital beds occupied. Uh, that of course would have uh, would give different results. And um, 
depending on the disease that you're looking at. So I'm not sure I uh, can really answer this question because again, I have not seen the slides presented by Simon, and, uh, but it is clear that um, it is important that you choose the right outcomes for the question that particularly policymakers would ask you. Um, clearly with the COVID-19 crisis, um, the death was an issue, but before that, uh, the risk of saturation of hospitals has probably been the main outcome for us because um, the strategy uh, for policymaking has been if we get to a point that we may be in a situation where hospitals become fully saturated and we can no longer admit patients, whether it is for COVID or for any other disease, then there is a need to stop the um, incidence. And then that's where we had to apply collective measures, uh, control measures, um, like closing places, like um, limiting the number of people that could be in a given space. And uh, it was also with mandatory masking and also with a strong recommendation for vaccination. Um, so, I mean, this is where the reason why the strategy has been based on the saturation of hospitals. This probably was the main criteria that would, uh, let's say, um, uh, bring the government to take those measures at the collective uh, scale. Um, if there was not this risk of saturation, it was only a risk of individual dying, uh, then it's another issue. Uh, and depending on the disease, uh, like we see with flu every year, uh, we have seen that we can accept um, up to 10,000 people dying every year of flu without having any restriction measures taken at the uh, collective um, scale. So it's just to stress the importance of choosing the right outcome for your model based on the questions that the policymakers will ask you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Arnaud. Um, so the next question is about um, T cell uh, immunity. So uh, wh what are the techniques that uh, allows to evaluate the T cell uh, immunity? And um, is this T cell response more durable that, than the serum antibody, um, than the antibody response um, in COVID-19? I think it's more for Frédéric to reply to regarding the immunological part. I may eventually complete uh, with some of what we have learned regarding the difference between neutralizing antibodies and cellular immunity based on number of vaccines you have received. But I would rather have Frédéric starting with the way of measuring T cells and, and, and the rest. Oh, yes, yes, Arnaud, thank you. Usually T cell response is more uh, long-term uh, duration than uh, antibody yeah. response. This is because the T cell, uh, uh, memory T cells and TRM cells also uh, reside for a longer time than the B cells. Uh, and But uh, in this case, uh, I must admit that uh, I don't remember the papers uh, about the, 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 the mRNA vaccines on, on the, on the follow-up of uh, vaccinated individuals and on the duration of T cell. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, but this again, you have both the part, uh, the duration of memory uh, is, is based on the antigen, but also based on the antigen properties, but also on the, the vaccine technology uh, properties. Uh, so mRNA vaccine uh, were uh, inducing very strong T cell response uh, at, at start, after the, the first shot. Uh, that you could imagine that they may uh, persist for a long term. Uh, although I don't know really uh, what has been, uh, we should go to that to those papers, but I'm not sure that this was really evaluated uh, on the long term in sufficient population uh, because it's mostly antibody that was evaluated. Uh, but again, yes, T cell usually persists longer than B cells. And, and again, this is also depending on the infection because for some infection, B cells, <clears throat> very, very long-term uh, persisting. 
but in the, you know, this, again, we are uh, uh, touching the, the problem of coronaviruses is here, which is specific to coronaviruses, but that we know that they are not uh, able to elicit uh, very stable immune responses. And that we can, we can be reinfected uh, even several times a year uh, with different coronaviruses that uh, are responsible for uh, mild disease or even asymptomatic. So we know, uh, and this is a topic that immunologists and virologists should look at. We know at, uh, at start that there is a problem with uh, memory immunity with coronaviruses. Then uh, the vaccine news mostly were uh, mRNA vaccines or adeno-based vaccine that we don't really know much uh, about the longevity of the response they can elicit. So this is still something to be uh, uh, understand and elaborate. I hope this <laughs> answer is enough. But, uh... I, I may complete with a few of the things that uh, have been uh, noticed. Uh, and my expertise is really, first of all, I'm not an immunologist and it's restricted only to COVID-19 on which I have uh, uh, read uh, a little bit what's going on. Um, what is now pretty clear is that um, B cells and neutralizing antibodies and the concentration that you have in blood will tell you reasonably well how well you will be protected against reinfection. And uh, we have seen that it is not lasting very long, that following either um, vaccines and their boosters or infections, you can get the level of neutralizing antibody, which is pretty high and which declines with time. And with the emergence of some variants with high escape immunity properties like the Omicron variant, um, even if people, people who have been fully vaccinated can be infected, they have a certain level of protection, which may be 50% reduction in risk after the booster dose, but it's not a full protection as would have been expected. We also should remember that we are talking about virus which is entering through the uh, nose and throat and that your immunity and neutralizing antibodies are primarily in the blood um, after the injections you got intramuscularly, for instance, or subcutaneously. So um, you're not taking into account the mucosal immunity, which may eventually be important for protection. The cellular immunity, like CD4 helpers or cytotoxicity uh, CD8 cells, um, may be more important for the protection against several forms of disease. And they seem to be long lasting. This is seen in epidemiological studies where we do see that the protection against infection decreases rapidly over time, but the risk of hospitalization is um, decreased for longer period of time. So this is reassuring. And um, it seems that uh, we consider now that you need at least three antigenic exposures, whether it would be two injections of vaccines and one infection or two injections of vaccines during the primary series and your booster dose to have a reasonably good uh, long lasting immunity against severe forms of disease. So it's really important to get your booster shot. And, um, and that uh, so far seems to be pretty good. There could also be local production of uh, neutralizing antibodies with uh, memory B cells located in the lungs, for instance, that may also be activated after you have been exposed to the virus again uh, during a reinfection. And that would take two or three days before you get this additional protection against a severe form of disease. So it's not only the cellular immunity, but possibly also some of the humor immunity that helps in the protection against severe forms. But our experience now is that, unfortunately, we don't have sterilizing immunity, as Frederick said, and we will be very likely constantly reinfected every year um, with the waning of uh, humoral immunity and emergence eventually of slightly divergent variants compared to previous ones. Uh, but what we can hope is that we are adding every, uh, at every infection or every injection we get a vaccine, a new layer of protection. And that series of layers of protection will protect you against severe forms of disease. Okay, thank you for, for this answer. So uh, next question uh, I got in the Q&A is, 
uh, is again on the, the, the vaccine uh, for SARS-CoV-2. So on average, vaccine development takes around 10 to 15 years. With COVID-19, this process was only one year. What factors made the process of the vaccine development extremely fast? I can answer this one. Uh, first, research was fast because the virus was already discovered and its sequence was published and uh, publicly available online. So it was very rapid and easy to define the antigenic, uh, the antigen to be uh, inserted into a vaccine. Uh, second, we had the previous experience of SARS-1 uh, 10, uh, 10 years ago, for which many uh, vaccines had been developed. Uh, and third, uh, because of the huge amount of money uh, given to the to those development at the beginning, uh, it was possible. And because, of course, because it was an emergency, it was a, a pandemic that was panicking the world. Uh, it was made possible to uh, contract the clinical trials and to perform simul almost simultaneously phase one, two, three, uh, meaning that after a, a few uh, uh, escalating those uh, safety uh, tests, uh, the volunteers were introduced uh, uh, enrolled in two phase two that was rapidly transformed into phase three. Uh, and this was fast because the money was uh, fueling uh, that, re that the development. And at the end, a uh, process of a clinical trial process that usually takes one year, uh, one year for a phase one, uh, two years for a phase two, because usually you make several phase two uh, for several doses, several age, uh, several uh, uh, regimen of administration. Uh, then uh, you have to gather uh, funding to start the phase three. And usually phase three takes two to four years. Uh, so all this was contracted in uh, one year. Uh, so that was really a big success of the, the vaccine industry, mainly in the US, because we have to say that, except for AstraZeneca, almost all trials and phase three trials were uh, developed in the US, uh, thanks to a military organization. So that was really a, a, a big response against the pandemic. And this is a good thing, because the vaccine was very effective at reducing mortality and, and, and a complicated cases. Uh, but obviously, uh, this is doable only in the period of pandemic, uh, of a very dangerous pandemic. Because, uh, and, and also served also a third reason that the, the regulatory agencies were uh, very uh, helpful and positive to cross the steps rapidly. Uh, for an example, just a, 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 an example, in France, when we performed uh, the, the single uh, clinical trial that was performed for a, vac a candidate vaccine against COVID, uh, the French agency, INSM, authorized the trial without any preclinical, regulatory preclinical data based on the fact that the platform had already previously generated such data. So uh, this was a, a three to four months, six months gain of time. Uh, if you do the same for the clinical trials, okay, uh, you can go very fast. Thanks, Frédéric, for your answer. Um, so next question uh, is about the SARS-CoV-2 variants. So, um, sorry. I lost the question. No. So what explains that some variants are less virulent than others? For example, uh, Delta variant compared to Omicron. I can take this one. Um, in the history of the emergence of variants during this crisis, we have seen until Delta variants that tend to be more severe than the previous ones. It was true for alpha compared to D614G, and then it was true for delta compared to alpha. And this has not been fully explained. Um, maybe the virologist here would complete after I have finished, but um, there was a tendency for having higher viral loads for this variant compared to previous ones. I'm not sure about 
any of the mutations associated, for instance, with the transmission that has been shown or the multiplicative capacity of the virus that have been convincingly shown that uh, explain why the alpha was more severe than the D614G or delta compared to alpha. What was really different was what happened with the Omicron variant. Um, that variant is issued very likely from um, chronic infection in a patient with severe immunosuppression. Um, there have been case reports of chronic SARS-CoV-2 infection in patients uh, suffering from HIV AIDS in South Africa, uh, where during infections that were lasting about six months uh, in these HIV infected individuals, you had accumulations of mutations um, that mimic what has been seen for Omicron. Um, so Omicron also being uh, described first in South Africa, there is a high level of suspicion that this could be the results of this chronic infection in an HIV infected individual, uncontrolled. And the case studies that have been published show that those patients with HIV did not have the right um, antiviral treatment, and therefore they had very low CD4 counts and very high HIV viral load. At the time, these mutations were accumulating. The end result with the Omicron virus was a variant which had 70 mutations difference compared to previous ones, um, affecting different parts of the genome and particularly the spike protein. And this Omicron variant had a capacity to infect cells, um, not only uh, through the typical route that its predecessor had used which involves a protease, which has a terrible name on the surface, uh, something with TMPRSS2. I don't never know in which order, and the virologist will let me know. But anyway, this was a classical way of entry for the uh, SARS-CoV-2 variants into cells. But this time, the Omicron variant was also able to use another uh, entry, uh, which is the endosomal way. And um, this opened new uh, possibilities for infection, particularly in the um, uh, upper respiratory system where um, diversity of cells uh, was more numerous for entry of Omicron compared to previous variants, which also explains why this Omicron had a tropism for the upper respiratory system and upper bronchi uh, more than for the lung. And, which, and that has been shown also in animal models uh, like hamsters. And that mimics what has been seen um, for the uh, clinical manifestations associated with Omicron, where uh, the severe uh, lung disease has been less common compared to previous one. So this is um, uh, what really makes Omicron very different. Um, next to its uh, capacities to escape immunity uh, much better than the previous ones. And, um, and therefore, we ended up having um, incredibly high incidence level, including among vaccinated people. But fortunately, a severity which was not as important as with previous variants. Still, in non-immunized populations, severity can be high. Look at what is happening in Hong Kong right now where the older uh, generations have not been uh, properly immunized, probably 50% rate only, and without mRNA vaccines, the mortality rate currently seen in Hong Kong is two to three times higher compared to what was seen during the first wave, March 2020 in Europe. So it's something absolutely uh, catastrophic, which shows that even Omicron considered to be a benign virus, can be extremely harm harmful in a non-immunized population. Thank you, Arno. So um, the next question, um, well, maybe you already uh, answered partially to this question. So is there a correlation between the severity of COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 viral load? Yeah, partially. Uh, suggested for alpha and delta, uh, not for Omicron. Um, again, because of this very different nature of Omicron. Um, that's as, as far as I can, I would be able to answer. 
Okay, thank you. So uh, next question is, what do you think about the first dose of COVID-19 vaccine? Is that necessary, especially in comor comorbidity cases? So um, I, it, what is now, um, we were saying, let's say there are two different objectives. Um, one is to protect against infection and one is to protect against several form of disease. Unless you are with an epidemic wave, which is really very, very intense, it is unlikely that we will try now to slow down the circulation of the virus, because again, we know that this is just a temporary protection that we get with an additional dose because the neutralized antibodies decline this time. So the real objective now of the vaccination is more to ensure that people are protected against the severe forms of disease, because now we are in a strategy where the goal is no longer to eliminate or eradicate this virus, but to prevent the severe form of disease. In that context, as we were mentioning earlier, fortunately, the protection against severe forms, largely mediated by cellular immunity, seems to be long lasting, except maybe in certain populations, particularly the older ones, more than 80 years of age, which suffer from what is called immunosenescence, uh, which is the uh, alteration of the immune response related to aging. And there, uh, it is indeed interesting to offer them a false dose because we believe that they may be again at risk of severe form of disease. And in the French statistics, we have seen uh, mortality increasing again in the older than 80 in the recent weeks. And that was the reason why the recommendation has been made to give them a false dose. Now the Haute Autorité de Santé um, is uh, advising for extending this four dose to the 65 plus with comorbidities. And I think it makes sense um, as the timing of that dose uh, may be a little bit complicated because we do not know how long the current wave will be lasting. And we are currently suffering a small increase related to BA2. Um, but then we expect after to move to the spring and summer, which would be much quieter. And therefore, there is a strategic choice in saying, should we do a false dose now, or hope that this uh, increase related to BA2 would just be a big bump, but no more, and wait until the fall for the fourth dose, not clear. Uh, maybe there will be a fourth dose now and a fifth dose in the fall. Um, what is pretty sure is that we will feel more comfortable if we can give an additional protection before the fall, because we expect with the effect of the season that the COVID-19 epidemic will resume during the next fall and winter. And thank you. So next question is not about the COVID, yeah, it's about Ebola. So what do you think about Ebola in 2022? Are we more prepared and armed to fight against new epidemies? And take this one uh, on the on the vaccine side, and uh, maybe Arnaud on the, the epidemiology side because the epidemiology of Ebola is completely different. But on the vaccine side, we already have a vaccine that was developed by Merck by a Canadian company uh, that was uh, bought by Merck uh, uh, afterwards, and the vaccine is based on the VSV uh, vesicular stomatitis virus vector, uh, expressing uh, uh, two antigens of the of the Ebola virus, uh, and there are also many other uh, vaccine strategy being developed. Ebola is a filovirus, very uh, dangerous and a very pathogenic infection. So, in case of an Ebola pandemic, of course, mortality would be uh, much higher. But uh, there is not much risk that such pandemic developed with this virus because uh, it's a difficult infection. Well, transmission is, is very easy between the uh, human beings, but the first step of transmission from the, the animal to the human is, is very difficult, but we were surprised with the, the rapidity of the COVID-19 transmission from the bats to humans uh, in, in, the, in, in that uh, previous pandemic. So there are already some vaccines uh, that have been demonstrated to be efficacious to protect uh, in trials, in the ring vaccination trials performed by WHO uh, that were very positive, uh, that we don't really know uh, in a routine 
used because the, this vaccine was also very reactogenic and the high dose needed, the, it's a live replicating vaccine and the high dose, the dose was 10 to the seven PFU uh, used for, uh, for protective efficacy. And this high dose was quite uh, reactogenic. So uh, I'm not sure that such vaccine might be accepted by a European or American agencies for use uh, in Europe or in the US. But so far, uh, Ebola epidemics happen in, uh, in Africa. Uh, and well, this vaccine has not really been used uh, during the last uh, epidemic of outbreak of Ebola. So we still don't really know if we have a good vaccine in hand, but at least we have one. So just to complete on the epidemiology, um, the vaccine that Frederick was referring to has been um, developed, or let's say it was on the shelves and it has been really pushed during the 2013 and 14 um, epidemic in West Africa, where there was an urgent need to, to have this vaccine. Since there have been epidemics of Ebola in uh, Central Africa, which is the usual place where those epidemics take place, um, what has changed in the epidemiology of those um, of Ebola is that uh, now those epidemics can take place in um, areas which are much more populated than before. I mean, it can get into a city of one million inhabitants, like Beni, you know, um, in, in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. So we are no longer talking about a small outbreak in a village in remote tropical Africa. We are talking about outbreaks that can get into cities. And therefore, uh, we would be much more vulnerable to an extension of those outbreaks because control is, is extremely difficult. Fortunately, we have these vaccines and uh, recent outbreaks could be controlled, uh, even though they were reaching number of cases that we were not seeing in the past because of the density and mobility of population. And there is also a drug which has been uh, used and proven successful, which is a monoclonal antibody. Uh, its use is much um, less simple than the vaccine. So the strategy would definitely rely on the vaccine in case of new outbreaks. But we know also that there is a drug that can be eventually uh, given to, to cure patients, and which I don't remember the cure rate, but I would say in the 50% probably a better efficacy compared to the standard treatment so far. So it's already uh, um, a, a good um, achievement. Um, but we can expect that we will have more uh, Ebola outbreaks. And again, in densely populated areas, it's really um, comforting to know that the vaccines can be deployed because the control would be much more difficult otherwise. Uh, thank you. Uh, so um, next question is, is there a downside of frequent repeated immunization via vaccination? Frederic? <laughs> uh, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, yes, yeah, sorry. Is there a downside of frequent repeated immunization via vaccination? Is there a what? Uh, downside. Downside. Um, uh, downside. Hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, not really, in fact. <laughs> not really, in fact, because for, uh, uh, well, for many live attenuated vaccines, we don't have to repeat immunization. It's okay. And uh, these vaccines are able to control the transmission, uh, to reduce uh, and even eliminate or eradicate. Uh, the, the agent uh, for uh, inactivated or protein vaccines, we can do boosting. Usually boosting are, are performed every 10 years. And this is the first time that we have to boost every three months, which is a new history in vaccines. And well, my point of view is that these vaccines are not really what we can call vaccine. In fact, it's preventive uh, therapy, uh, preventive uh, drugs or any, I don't know how to call that because the vaccine is supposed to be uh, uh, for long-term uh, immunization. So uh, we don't have much experience to say, except the experience developed so far with this COVID vaccine that we know that we can experience uh, up to four uh, injections without any, uh, well, let's say without much more adverse events than uh, after the first injection, and most adverse events occur after, after the first injection, in fact, and, and the, the, the repeated dose 
just boost the immunity. So just play a role on the immune system. Uh, and for that role, we know that there is no absolutely no downside effect. Uh, we know that we can boost and reboost many times uh, our, uh, our B cells and T cells. Uh, we know that the diversity of the immune system is so broad that uh, we will never achieve in, in a lifetime span uh, saturation of any of these systems. So a priori, there is no problem except problem that would be linked to the toxicity of the vaccine. And in that case, uh, we have to say that uh, even after first, after four uh, injection, uh, the initial toxicity was not increased. Um, what? Arnaud? No. No, I can just say that the Israeli data on the fourth dose shows similar side effects compared to the third dose. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks. So next question is uh, the current protocol of of therapy um, in the UK for symptomatic COVID-19 infection relies on antivirals and also extensive use of steroids. Can this therapy with steroids affect the correct building up of a long lasting immunity and has been ev evaluated in any trial? Um, I could eventually start to reply on this and leave it for, uh, for Frederick. Um, the steroids only are only prescribed for people who have severe forms of, uh, of disease. They are hospitalized, and uh, it's only when they really get into the long complications that steroids are offered. And in parallel, we know that the people that have had severe forms of disease have a stronger immunity compared to people that have had mild form disease or asymptomatic. So I would not be able to say exactly to which extent the use of steroids may have impaired the building up of the long lasting immunity, but basically most hospitalized patients in the Western world have received steroids. And we know that they have a stronger immunity compared to people who have done mild form of disease. Whether it would have been stronger in the absence of steroids, I don't know, but the fact that they had a very severe form of disease, I mean, as is now correlated to his, uh, with pretty good immunity. So it, it has not been that bad, but I can't say more. <laughs> no, I agree with you, Arnaud. And, and uh, maybe this is due to the fact that these treatments, these steroid treatments are uh, performed at the moment of the, uh, of the, uh, the at the moment where the disease uh, becomes uh, stronger, uh, maybe 10, 15 days after initiation of disease and maybe uh, two to three weeks after infection itself. And probably at that moment, uh, the initiation, the triggering of immune response uh, have already, already been engaged and the immune responses are already here. So treatment with uh, steroids will downregulate uh, development of T cells, uh, proliferation of T and B cells at that moment and probably also uh, inflammation. And this will not, I, I can't imagine that this should not impact uh, the immunity uh, previously engaged at the moment of infection during incubation of the disease. Thank you. Uh, next question is, um, why is it difficult to develop an effective vaccine against Plasmodium falciparum or HCV? It's, it's, it's looking like a, a vaccine uh, move <laughs> rather than an emerging disease move. <laughs> there are other people, uh, other professors that could answer other questions. Well, a plasmodium is completely different. It's a parasite. It's a, it's a 5,000 uh, antigens uh, uh, bug uh, uh, with uh, three different phases, uh, stages of infection. Uh, that is not very clear uh, which stage uh, must be uh, used for protection. Uh, the blood stage or the, the sporozoid stage. Uh, so, and, and in each stage, the, the uh, antigens uh, exposed by the by the, the parasite are different. So, this is the first point. Uh, what is the basis of your vaccine? Except the use of a live attenuated sporozoid vaccine or inactivated sporozoid vaccine, which is a strategy. Uh, developed uh, currently. Uh, and second, uh, malaria is a 
highly diverse uh, parasites. So once you have developed uh, antigens, uh, they, they will vary uh, considerably on the field. Uh, it's very difficult. And, and third point, uh, again, the immunity to malaria is very difficult to understand. And the fact that you can become with time uh, protected and then one day you can lose protection is very difficult. We don't know, again, if uh, uh, individuals who are not exposed, uh, and apparently we know that individuals who are not exposed continually lose their immunity. Uh, so that means that uh, we should either eradicate the parasite or continue immunizing the kids, the, the young babies, in order to try to avoid uh, the, 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 the big uh, heavy disease uh, in, in, in young infants. So far, there is the, the GSK vaccine, RTSS, which is based on the, on the Hep B uh, virus particle, just expressing uh, additionally the TSP protein, uh, which is one of the main antigens of the sporozoite stage of malaria. And this vaccine uh, appears to afford the 30%, 35% protection against severe neurologic malaria disease in young infants. Uh, but protection, well, currently the vaccine is tested on the long term. WHO has asked a long-term four to five years follow-up of vaccines in order to be sure that protection, to determine uh, uh, the, the, the length of protection uh, and to be sure that there is no uh, antibody dependent activation of reinfection. Um, thank you. So it's gonna be one of our last questions. So, um, have emerging uh, zoonotic viral surveillance strategies changed or increased since the current pandemic? And how can surveillance leverage a quick response given the zoonotic jump is unpredictable? This is for Arnaud. <laughs> Very simple questions, of course. <laughs> the, well, currently, I think we are a little bit too close from the pandemic itself to um, to have had a chance to rethink our surveillance. Um, uh, what has become obvious is that the risk of emergence from uh, wild or farmed animals uh, can lead to uh, worldwide threats of the magnitude of what we have seen with COVID-19. So I believe it will be taken more seriously uh, this time, although I believe also people want to forget very quickly. So um, uh, not sure how much we will be heard when we will come back with the same messages about the the risk of introduction from either wildlife or farmed animals. Um, there, uh, clearly, you know, uh, markets in China um, have been uh, involved on two occasions now uh, in the emergence of a major coronavirus pandemic. And I believe the Chinese authorities will take very strong measures to prevent that to happen again. Um, it's more complex with flu, for instance, where um, the farmed animals, whether these are the poultry or the uh, pigs, are a little bit more essential to our daily um, food. So this will be uh, organized the way it is now with surveillance of emergence of, um, of new influenza strains in, in these uh, populations, but preventing it to jump to humans is quite difficult. What so on one point, I believe that there will be more severe measures to uh, restrict um, um, contact with wildlife uh, where it is easy to do. And I was citing the examples of the markets in China. Two, in places where animals are uh, essential to uh, the feeding of humans, like farms, uh, then the surveillance will probably be uh, strengthened. Um, and there are things to do, for instance, is not living in close proximity, the poultry farming and the pigs farming, because we know that exchange of viruses uh, across the two species can lead to recombinants, which can uh, then uh, be responsible for new influenza strain. Now, the experience we have had in the past 20 years is that the emergence basically hardly took place where we thought it would. Um, and uh, 
this calls for um, really increase the surveillance and the capacity to react very quickly where new uh, viruses um, or pathogens are emerging because we can't anticipate where it will happen. I mean, if you take uh, Zika, uh, it was circulating uh, at low scale in Asia and then it jumped to uh, the Pacific Ocean and Latin America, totally unexpected. The 2009 influenza pandemic uh, started in Mexico, a place that was not really a hotspot for emergence. Um, at least that's where it was detected. Um, we have seen the MERS in 2012 in Gulf countries. I mean, definitely not a place where we thought uh, we would have transmission of coronavirus from dromedary camels to humans. And the Ebola, uh, we discussed it, uh, used to be in Central Africa in 2013-14. The main outbreak was in West Africa, again, an unexpected place. So it's really important now that the surveillance is um, broadened and extremely reactive. Because when we look at what happened in China this time, when we see how the Chinese have been efficient in controlling uh, SARS-CoV-2 when they really put the means on it, I'm talking about the lockdown of the 23rd of January, 2020 in Wuhan. Uh, what if they had done that a month earlier um, when they had their surveillance system had detected uh, seven cases of, uh, uh, of COVID-19 and mid-December, uh, I was quite amazed that they were able to connect seven cases in a city of 11 million people with people that went to different hospitals. And indeed they had in place a, coron uh, a surveillance for influenza and coronavirus, which worked well. Unfortunately, the reaction has been too slow. Um, they did very well for the sequencing of, the, of this new genome because by five, January 5, the genome was complete and it was posted on January 10. But unfortunately, the uh, epidemiological response has been too late. And, and we understand now how crucial it would have been that the uh, earlier response would have been brought. It's easy to say now, you know, because, um, well, I mean, we, we know what happened later on, but I think that it's a good case for saying that when you start to have um, emerging um, clusters of unknown disease, it's really important that the reaction is extremely rapid um, and, and that's probably what we have learned from this crisis. To my knowledge, there has not been yet a new um, reformatting um, of the international health regulations, for instance, like it happened in 2005 after the 2003 SARS pandemic. Uh, there will certainly be one. There have been probably some amendments in uh, uh, enforcing earlier um, declaration of outbreaks, but I think that has to be now considered at uh, at a more global level, and uh, and it's uh, part of the lessons to take uh, following this COVID nineteen uh, crisis. And thank you, Arnaud. So yeah, this question was in in line with the the, the theme that we wanted to address at the end of this session, uh, which is that so mo most of the videos of this MOOC were recorded before the pandemic. And we wanted to have your, your opinion on how do you think that this pandemic has changed the field of emerging viruses and in particular like prevention and, and response to emerging viruses. So I don't know, maybe Fred, you want to, to Frederic, you want to give your opinion about that? Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> what? How, how do you think that the, the pandemic changed the, the prevention and response to emerging viruses? Well, a lot, <laughs> a lot of things. Uh, but what has mainly changed is the vaccine industry. Uh, it was a revolution, uh, meaning that the, 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 the big five of the vaccine industry, uh, most of them failed to develop on, in time a, a vaccine. And uh, rather, there was biotechs linked to big companies, and Pfizer has a uh, big nose to to uh, to work with uh, BioNTech and AstraZeneca also to to uh, look at the work at uh, Oxford University to develop their vaccines. 
and well, and and you know the uh, also the 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 money uh, generated by this vaccination has changed completely because uh, the 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 incomes of all vaccine industry was around 40 billion a year. And now it has jumped to 60 million a year. And this is mainly due to two vaccines, the Moderna and, and, and the Pfizer BioNTech. For different reasons, the price has increased and the number of doses has increased. Uh, and and the, all the countries, the, the governments uh, decided to pay for that. Uh, so uh, yes, this has changed uh, completely uh, the, the profile of the uh, industry. Uh, let's hope that uh, on the, the technical and biological aspect of vaccines, the mRNA vaccines uh, will be as uh, efficacious in other conditions than in, in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, condition uh, infection, because in, in other case, uh, we would be very happy also to have these vaccines developed so rapidly. Uh, so yeah, it's mainly uh, a change because again, it's different, it, it, different uh, according that you want to uh, immunize a population against an, an, an endemic uh, pathogen, uh, whatever the country or you want to protect against a, a, an outbreak or a, a powerful uh, pandemic, just uh, like we had. Uh, so you, do, you don't have the same means, you don't have the same amount of people to immunize. Uh, every year, the 100, uh, roughly 130 million babies are born on earth have to be immunized against 10 to 15 uh, valence of uh, vaccines. And, all of them are not vaccinated against all the needed uh, balance they should be. Uh, so this is something that we should continue. Uh, but for sure, uh, concerning uh, vaccination against pandemic, emergent, emergent pandemics, uh, mRNA vaccines and, and other vectors have proved to be uh, uh, efficacious to do that. So we don't know what is going to be the next pandemic, whether it's going to be a respiratory virus, and a, and, and, and Nipah, Hendra, or any uh, other uh, mobili virus, or uh, flu-like virus, or filovirus, or narbovirus. <laughs> so then the technique will have to adapt to the next infection and, 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 and the, the site of infection, whether is it uh, respiratory acquired or uh, through a, a mosquito bite or uh, any other, and the immunity is different in each case. So we still have work to do. Uh, but what has changed the most is the vaccine industry. This is for sure. I, I have a question for you, uh, Fred, if, it, if this is allowed. <laughs> yeah, sure. This uh, crisis has cost between 250 and 400 million euros to France. If you scale it to the global level, it's somewhere between five to ten thousand billion dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so five, five to ten thousand billion. 000. billion. Um, <laughs> let's say ten thousand billions. Yes, exactly. I never know where trillions, whatever, get into. No, so no, I prefer billion. to say in French we say billion, milliard. I, <laughs> I, yeah, and I prefer to say ten thousand billions mm -hmm. or. 10 mil milliards yes, de dollars. This is what it costs the world. Um, the next threat is likely to be a respiratory virus. If we think of pandemic of that magnitude between influenza and coronaviruses, when you see the number of co-infections of coronavirus in bats, mm -hmm. and you think of recombination, um, I mean, you can imagine really a new coronavirus coming out anytime. For pan coronavirus or pan influenza vaccines, is it would money be makes a difference in developing them, or it's not money? Because if we if you tell me that it's a question of money and if we had whatever is required, then it's easy to talk to the decision makers and tell them look at how much it costs you 
just give one billion dollars to Frédéric Tangi and you will get a pan coronavirus vaccine or a pan influenza vaccine. So is money an issue or it, 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 it goes far beyond that? Money is not an issue. As long as, of course, Africa is not concerned <laughs> because it's always the same, you know, the COVAX uh, initiative uh, is working, but they, it's very difficult to achieve. But, but for the development of a vaccine, for development of a vaccine that would cover all yeah. coronavirus strains or all influenza strains, what would be the main obstacle? Yes, no, money is not the issue. I'm sure money is not the issue. Because 10,000 billion, the cost of the pandemic, I agree with the hospitals, with the arrêt travail, no, uh, with the mass, we are. With everything, with, with the economic uh, mm. loss, uh, sure, it's very, very expensive. And the market, the vaccine market has just improved by mm -hmm. 30 something million. billion. Mm -hmm. So it's 30 uh, to uh, 10,000, so it's nothing. Uh, the cost for vaccine is not much. It's not expensive to develop the vaccine, uh, and the vaccine. What would be the, but the, what the, would the, be the main the main obstacle for? I mean, what we need is a pan coronavirus vaccine, a vaccine that protect, protects against all strains of coronaviruses, this is the or difficulty. all strains of influenza. And what where is the main difficulty there? Scientific. It, it's not a, a matter of cost. It, it's a, a science problem because. If you want to imagine a pan coronavirus, okay, uh, based on mRNA vaccine, which is the simplest to do, because you just have to synthesize. Uh, it, it, it's a machine who makes the, the, the RNA molecule. It's very easy. So you can imagine 10 or 11 or 15 sequences of spike from different coronaviruses. But then it's the, the, the biology uh, of the vaccine is difficult because you know that the dose is important. And, and, and uh, the active dose, for example, for the Pfizer vaccine is 30 microgram. And if they lower that to 10, uh, the vaccine is much less effective. And if you increase above 30, toxicity is increasing. Uh, tolerability is, uh, is uh, diminishing. So if you want to mix uh, 10 or 15 uh, different mRNA molecules for uh, 10 or 15 different viruses, uh, in order to keep the tolerability of the vaccine in good, uh, in a good uh, level, you will have to lower the amount of active RNA. Uh, let's say with one or two, three micrograms for each. And we know that at these doses with the current techniques, they are not active at all. So probably the industry needs to improve the formulation, needs to improve uh, the, the tolerability and the toxicity of the liposomes uh, used to encapsulate these molecules. But this will probably make progress in, in the next uh, five to 10 years, I'm sure. Sure of that. Okay, so we, you don't need money anyway. That's what I understood. Well, we need money, <laughs> but far less than 10,000 million. Okay. You're, not, you're not too demanding. Okay, no, thanks. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if uh, Jean-Pierre Jean or Pierre-Manuel, you, you want to add a comment to, to this team? No, thank you to yes. Arnaud and uh, Frédéric for the intervention and for all the questions. And, uh, and thank you to the, thanks to the team, Pasteur team for this uh, organization. So, yeah, 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 thank you very for, for your very nice commentary and uh, and uh, and uh, great knowledge on the on the topics and I, I, i'm quite sure that it was uh, uh, successful for for everybody and thanks to you maxime uh, for organizing this uh, this webinar et vive les MOOC. <laughs> <laughs> okay so th thank you everyone thank you for for joining us and thank you for your interest and your questions um you, you can continue to to put your question in the forum uh, since the MOOC will be running until uh, April 14th. Um, I really want to, to, to thank the, the four speakers of today and um, for the thank you for all those answers, the, the clarity and the, the quality of it. Um, I would like to, to, to thank uh, also the, the MOOC team, so Clementine Schild, Odile Cismero and uh, Leonardo Alvarez. 
Um, I think this webinar has been recorded and it will be soon available on the Institute Pasteur Education uh, YouTube channel. And uh, so, um, yeah, they enjoy the rest of the course and good luck uh, on the test for those who will attend the, the exam. Bye. Okay, thanks. Bye bye, oh, wow. everybody.